Am I correct in assuming that the angels mentioned in 1 Timothy 3.16 are the imprisoned angels that Jesus has spoken to? Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, Rebellious divine beings aren't typically called angels without some qualifier for clarity. Now, there's an exception, which I'll get to in a moment, but usually we get things like, quote, angels that sinned, or evil spirits, or spirits in prison, or the devil and his angels. Those qualifiers help identify what side this partic- a particular being is on. Now, the exception, is, the, the clear one anyway, is 1 Corinthians 6.3, don't you know that you're going to judge angels? Again, that's very likely a reference to the inheritance of the nations that we've talked about a lot on this podcast that I talk about in Unseen Realm. It's very very likely a, a reference to the inheritance, inheritance of the nations, the displacing of the fallen sons of God that you know, get their beginning in Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9. But you know, it, it could be a general reference to glorified believers outranking angels at the end of the eschaton. But again, I think that it, has, it is a reference to the displacement of the sons of God because of other language in Revelation 2 and 3. Uh, again, you can go read that in, in Unseen Realm. If we, if we look at Hebrews 1 and 2, you have references there to, to things like, you know, that, that God didn't help the angels, but he helped human beings, again, through the atonement of Christ. That obliquely might suggest that he has fallen angels, you know, angels that might need redemption and can't get it there. Again, the, the passage, I, I think, certainly can be read that way. Uh, and, I, you know, I've, I've blogged recently about that, that that I think gives us an interpretive clue to the question of, of angelic redemption. But at the very least, even if he's not targeting, you know, fallen angels in that Hebrews passage, he's making it clear that the atonement and the effect of the atonement was about humanity. I mean, that, that, was, that was the big deal because Jesus became incarnate as a man, not as an angel, but as a man. So, again, that, that's an oblique reference. So it's not quite as clear of an exception uh, that, that 1 Corinthians 6.3 would be, but usually— we get some qualifier, again, to, to make the situation clear. And we don't have that in 1 Timothy 3.16. I would be, you know, with the, the mass of, of commentators here that would say, scene of angels in that passage is probably best interpreted as the angels at the tomb, uh, Luke 24.4. And I think even more specifically, Matthew 28.2. Uh, if you go to Matthew 28.2, let me just turn there real quickly. It says, Behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. Okay, and then he's, you know, they, it describes his appearance. It's an angel of the Lord. So some angel, you know, from God moves, moves the stone, rolls the stone away. Now, you know, are we, to, are we to presume that he never saw Jesus or Jesus didn't like pop out and say, good job, this is what you were supposed to? I mean, you'd have to assume that, that, he never saw this, the risen Savior, which, which to me is really a stretch. So I, I think that you know what we have in that reference scene of angels is probably best understood as the the opening of the tomb scene, you know, the resurrection, you know, kind of situation. Um, look at the order in First Timothy three sixteen. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. I mean, you can create something of a chronology for that. It's not really precise because he's taken up in glory, you know, before you know the the gospel really advances to the nations. So it's not it's not a really good chronology, but it has all the elements there of like the Book of Acts. And at least you could say you could argue, as many scholars do, well, the beginning of this is the incarnation and the resurrection through the power of the Spirit, and then you have the seen by angels thing which happens, again, after the vindication by the Spirit, which, again, most scholars would say is a reference to, you know, the being resurrected through the, through the power of the Holy Spirit, which, you know, is, is language that you get from other passages. And so since angels follows that, a lot of commentators would say, not a lot, but almost everybody, you know, would say that scene of angels here is about the, the resurrection scene, the tomb scene. And I, I think that's pretty reasonable here. 